Okay, we'll take questions. This gentleman had a question initially, so let's get him first. Now, please identify yourself and ask the question to a particular person. Uh, I'm Bob Benson. Uh, one of the things I've been looking for, and I haven't found, I asked this question before, is when, when the temp worldwide temperature is calculated, and I've seen some of the models, the pancakes that go uh, in quadrants, I'm an engineer, and my question is, how, is there a place where you can see exactly how the worldwide temperature is calculated that these graphs are done from? Because if you take a mean, I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, I'm just questioning, uh, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of questionable data here, but isn't there a way to get to the root mean world, or root temperature that they're using for the world, at least to see the, the to kind of dig into that. Yeah, Roy might have been able to answer that. Maybe Anthony can answer that. I didn't get all of that, unfortunately. Okay, what he said was, is there a way, is there a location where you can go to see all the worldwide temperature data and see how the mean is calculated? Well, and f can you enable my microphone here? Is it working? It is. It's working? Okay, yeah, the green light wasn't on, so I wasn't sure. One of the things about the way the temperature is calculated is that, that there's only one place that it gets done. Well, I shouldn't say one, but there's a couple places that it gets done. But they all come back to one source, and that is NOAA's National Climatic Data Center, since renamed National Climatic and Environmental Institute or whatever, NCEI. They have all of the worldwide data. They collect it from something called the GHCN network. And so they bring it into Asheville, North Carolina, and they process it. Unfortunately, while they have published peer-reviewed papers on how this process is done, we don't actually have the ability to run that code and test it. There's no external process by which we can look at that code and see, and well, as Sterling pointed out, test the formula. You know, and one of the biggest problems that we've got in climate science is that they rely on peer-reviewed papers. Oh, well, we published it in peer review. It must be right. Well, peer review doesn't mean jack if you're not inspecting the formulas. And a lot of these folks that are doing the peer reviews have busy lives and, and busy professional co commitments, and they don't have time to get down into the nitty-gritty. And so what we're dealing with here is formulas that are beholden specifically to the U.S. government that we cannot test externally, and that's a real problem. We can look at their peer-reviewed papers and see, yeah, this is what they're supposedly doing, but when it comes down to looking at the actual code, we can't. And we can't even replicate it because some of these things are run on massive computer systems that are difficult to replicate externally. Yeah, the, the peer review process for the, for the decision theory, he said what it is is we know the people who've written these papers. We either respect them or we don't. And uh, we look at the paper and we say, does that sound right, generally right? Yeah, and so that's the peer review process. Se seems right to us. Um, by the way, before the next question, because Roy's not here, I recommend going to Hartland's YouTube site. He did a preview of his presentation a few months ago, uh, which was on ocean data, that's why I brought up the ocean data, which was on ocean data and, and what it shows about warming. And you can view what uh, at least a, a preliminary version of his presentation might have looked like had he been able to join us. Next question. I'm Jerry Henson from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I think Anthony proved that the big problem is we need to keep the past from getting colder. And uh, Anthony, I was wondering if you know how many of the weather stations are now at uh, airports? Uh, he's asking if you know how many of the weather stations are still at airports or now at airports. Well, uh, right now we think there's about 25 to 30 percent of the weather stations at airports. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to be doing a follow-up study. We are going to be going back and looking at the surface stations uh, 10 years later, or more than 10 years now. Uh, and we're going to reevaluate the national network and see how many stations they've actually closed because we've embarrassed them publicly versus how many of the really bad stations they've kept open uh, and see what that, that new analysis is. But yeah, there's a lot of stations being measured or, or a lot of airports being measured. And 
Um, the reason for airports is that they report regularly on the hour. The problem with the airports is, you know, of course, there's lots of asphalt and concrete around, which brings up the nighttime temperature due to re-radiation of solar uh, energy that's absorbed during the day and, and brings the nighttime low up. But the other problem is, is that a lot of the airport thermometers aren't really designed for climate monitoring. Uh, and in fact, um, there are still some high temperature records that stand in the record set from uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. They had, I think, in 1993, one of their ASOS thermometers at the airport there go haywire, and it produced a really high temperature record. There was no other similar high temperature record within 100 miles of that airport. And they went and investigated and found out that the sensor system had failed. And yet, that record remains even though it's wrong. And that's the biggest problem with NOAA. They don't go back and fix stuff. They just sort of, yeah, brush it along. These folks never get out of the office to fix their own problems. Okay, uh, this gentleman will take and then we'll go here and then back, I believe. Uh, Roger Roots from Livingston, Montana. Uh, we, ha we all know the, uh, the people in charge of the temperature data have been adjusting the data to make the past cooler and the present warmer. And we all, I think most people here would say that doesn't pass the smell test. We clearly think they're, they're manipulating that for political reasons. But what we lack, it seems to me, is a smoking gun. We don't have any evidence that they know they're lying. They, we, we all suspect they're dishonest, but do, you, do any of you know of any, I don't know, emails, private conversations, any, anything like that? From, from NOAA or the P Gavin Schmidt, any of those people in charge of this, is there any smoking gun that we know of where they admit to being dishonest about doing that? Um, he asked, is there any smoking gun uh, email exchange or anything from NOAA that would show that they know that they're wrong about their temperature data and such? Well, um, I would say this, in the ClimateGate emails, Dr. Thomas Carl, oh, correct me, Thomas Carl, he doesn't really have a doctorate. Um, he, in his mention of, uh, way back in 2007, mentioned there's this meteorologist guy, Watts, out in California, who's out checking stations, and he's found a whole bunch of them that are messed up. And he was basically, it was a panic email. And, um, and so I didn't see any further emails beyond that. But to me, that was a smoking gun that, that they knew that they had problems. But here's the other thing. They also produced something called the Climate Reference Network, the most sophisticated surface measurement network in the world. Triple redundant sensors, state-of-the-art technology, error correction, the works. I've inspected these. I've looked at them. I approve. There are a bunch of them that are really, really well done. And yet, they do not publish this data with any of the monthly or yearly climate reports or national climate assessment reports. And the reason they don't is because the data doesn't reflect the current level of alarm out there. The current level of alarm out there drives funding. And I know this sounds, you know, kind of like conspiratory, but the, the problem is these folks are in empire building mode. They get huge amounts of money to study climate. And if there's no climate problem to study, they don't get any money. It's just that simple. And so it's become big business all around. And so they have to find ways to keep it going. And that's why we won't see things like the record that I showed you here um, published with the National Climate Assessment of the monthlies. They, they know they have problems. They know it's not as bad. But they're not going to admit to it because to admit to it costs them money. Um, it, I think they've also become more cautious in the wake of Climate Gate. Uh, if they didn't, they would have really been stupid. So um, I think that's one answer. But also, I think the closest you come to that happened in 2015 when this ocean paper came out just before, um, just before the Paris Agreement was signed. Because um, the gentleman who set up NOAA's data collection methodology, an award-winning scientist, I forget the gentleman's name at the time, it's, it's been six years now, I'm getting older, um, but you can look it up because I wrote about it at the time. Um, he came out publicly and said they should never have published this data. They should never have published, the, 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 the papers 
should not have accepted this because it did not go through our proper peer review process. And when we've asked them to produce the raw data to check it, they basically gave the dog ate my homework answers. We lost it. It was on a single disk that got destroyed. Their rules precludes keeping this kind of data on single disk. They have to keep it on the massive database that they've got. So they violated the agency's own rules. They rushed to publish. And the person who set up the rules, the award-winning guy that set up the rules, called him out on it. And he said, I'm very, I can't say that the paper is wrong. He didn't say that. He said, but it's very suspicious and it doesn't seem right. And it certainly violated all our principles. Let me, uh, this gentleman right here, third row back, third row, third in. Hi, I'm Rick Worma. I'm an occasional contributor to What's Up With That. I have one comment and one question. The comment is, I believe copies of Anthony's surface station studies are in the ballroom on the back table. They're in the eight and a half, 11 by whatever um, short report. So please check those out. The question is, Given that the CRN data has been out for so long, my suspicion is that people have not been adjusting the local temperature data for stations around the country over the last 20 years or so, but have relied on adjustments to the years before the CRN network was set up. Um, do you know if, if that's... Uh, meets, meets what other people have observed, and has anyone looked into this? Um, if I understood the question, you you may have to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he asked, so the CRM, the, the 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 reference data network was set up. It's good data. They're still using data before uh, that was set up. The the bad data. Do they give a reason for why they're doing that? Do they, yeah. Uh, well, they have on, on their webpage at NOAA, where you can look at the time series of data, they have this belief that they don't need to publish the climate reference network data as the pristine data or that we should measure the country by. Instead, they use it as a, an adjustment benchmark to try to adjust the other data to it. And, you know, we saw a presentation from Pat this morning about adjusting or tuning climate models to the temperature. Well, not only is that going on, but they're also trying to tune, you know, temperature data. And, and it's, it's just absolutely mind-boggling to me that why not just throw out the old network? The old network is, is made up of volunteers, some people that sometimes, and Marysville, California, for example, one of the very first stations I visited that said, we got a real problem. Now, the temperature data is taken down there by the secretary for the fire department, okay? She works nine to five weekdays. There was never, ever any temperature data recorded on the weekends. And when she went on vacation, it wasn't recorded then. Sick days? Nope, no temperature data. And that, that's the kind of temperature data that we have in this national system cooperative observer network. And I'm not faulting the observers, they're doing the best job they can, but that thing was originally designed to provide forecast validation for the weather service so that they could figure out, well, did we forecast enough rain? Did we forecast the temperature correctly? That's what it was designed for. It got co-opted to use for climate back in 1988 when Hansen made his big speech. And then they realized in the late 90s, wait a minute, it's not as accurate as we thought. So then they sort of, you know, quietly produced the climate reference network and said, oh, well, we've got this now. We're adjusting data. Everything's good. But the problem is, is that a lot of these folks really believe they can solve all of these problems by adjustments. And once they get it published, you know, oh, we've got a new homogenization algorithm. We've published it in a prestigious journal. But the same result ends up. We mix good data with bad data. And the real thing that should be happening is we throw out the bad data and just use the good data. And they, I can't seem to get it through their heads that that's what they should do. They won't do it. Now they instead come up with new and improved algorithms to fix bad data. And the bottom line is, is that the data is still a mix of muddy water. Yeah, I, I, I use the example when I talk of, 
so you've got river water, and I'm not talking Alaska river water that you might think is pristine, but muddy Trinity River water in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and you've got bottled water. And you think if you blend bottled water and Trinity River water, you're going to get a better result than the, than the bottled water? Shop? It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Noah it's, should bottle river water and sell it. There you go. There you go. So, um, new and improved with a new algorithm. It's right here. Before we go on, I'd like to ask, because we've got Dr. McKittrick online here, are there some questions for Dr. McKittrick? This gentleman, I think, is indicating he has a question for Dr. McKittrick. Speak loudly. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Charles Rotter uh, from the free state of Florida. <laughs> uh, Dr. McKittrick, aside from your um, mathematical criticisms of attribution analysis, on a higher level, a philosophical level, isn't the whole game of attribution analysis just a game of Texas sharpshooter logic? Like, let's look at this thing and see if we can attribute something to it. It's like, where were the climate attribution studies for the 17-year hurricane drought? Where are the climate attribution studies for the current global stilling in Europe? So isn't there a bigger philosophical issue with climate attribution studies, uh, even up over and above the mathematical and statistical flaws? Um, yeah, the, uh, there are two types of attribution studies. So some of them are um, looking at broad global patterns. So they, in principle, cover everything. But what gets a lot of attention now are event attribution studies. And that's the ambulance chasing side of it. That's where if there's a, a hurricane event or a flood event, then they do these event attributions and they come out and say, well, uh, it was 25% worse than it would have been because of the greenhouse gases. Um, and that one there, there, I think you're right that you have to ask a philosophical question. Um, if you only study bad events, then you can't point to the fact that all the outcomes are bad as evidence of anything. You only look for bad events. I'd like to see event attribution studies after a stretch of nice weather. And they could say, well, we might have had a stretch of really bad weather, except greenhouse gases in the atmosphere caused us to have sunny and warm weather instead. They don't do that. They only look for bad events. So then the fact that they find bad events doesn't teach us anything. And then the other point is you can't really test the, the results. I mean, if they come back and say the floods in Europe were... 12.37% worse than they would have been in the absence of greenhouse gases. Um, okay, if you say so, but we have to trust your model. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no independent, there's no objective uh, way you can, uh, can verify that. And um, it's, uh, it's also dependent on um, the reliability of their climate model. And in those types of studies, fundamentally what they do is they run a model twice with and without greenhouse gases and they look and see if there is a difference. And you have to believe that the, the model they're using is a, a complete and accurate representation of the climate system. And if you don't believe that, then you have no reason to believe in the results. So to your point, yes, event attribution studies are uh, guilty of the Texas sharpshooter fallacy that um, uh, they spray a pattern of bullets on the wall and then afterwards claim that that was exactly what they were aiming at. Um, they go and look at a bunch of bad weather events and then decide, uh, isn't that something that greenhouse gases always cause bad weather events? Yeah, it's a logical fallacy. They're they 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 they're. Uh, assuming what they're supposed to be proving. And it's, it's like uh, Michael Mann's uh, paper. Uh, if, the data, if the data changes, does, do the results change? If not, well, then we've got a problem because you knew what you wanted in the first place. Um, more questions. We've got a gentleman way over here. Sorry to make you run there, Samantha. I, 
right, Dave Stevenson with the Caesar Rodney Institute. First of all, Dr. Watts, I'd like to thank you. Uh, your work in the 90s inspired me to do something similar, and I'm, I'm, I now do it for a living, so thank you. Uh, first of all, a comment uh, for, from a couple questions ago. Matthew Mene, who did the study and published the paper on uh, homogenization, in his original paper had a sentence that said, without homogenization, there is no greenhouse, uh, there is no global warming. Uh, that sentence is no longer in the paper, by the way. Uh, my, my question for you, uh, sir, is uh, to go back, a little twist on the question that was answered before about the climate reference network. Those 114 stations existed before two, 2005. Has anybody summarized, uh, averaged the data for those, uh, those stations going back? Okay, uh, two things. His statement concerned Binet, and Binet saying without homogenization, uh, there is no global warming, and then having that statement removed from his paper. Uh, and the second, uh, the, the question has to do with the Climate Reference Network, and whether uh, anyone has tried to backcast using that to see what temperatures uh, would have or have, have been. Well, I, I would say that the, the graph that I presented in my presentation where you see the three different lines, the red, the orange, and the blue, they're still warming. Now, I want to make it really clear that I am absolutely on board with the fact that there has been warming over the last century, and not just in the United States, but in the world. Some of it has to do with natural variation. Some of it has to do with other things. But clearly what's happened is urbanization has contributed to additional warming, mostly contributing to the increase in temperature in the nighttime. In fact, um, a few years ago when we had a convention in Las Vegas, I presented two graphs for Las Vegas. And you can look them up I'm on a website or what's up with that. Just look for you know, climate conference in Las Vegas and you'll find the two graphs. And these were published by the local weather service here. And they were talking about the fact that because of the spectacular growth in Las Vegas, the temperature at McCarran National Airport, International Airport, had gone up tremendously. And they showed the average temperature had gone up. The maximum temperature was flat. The nighttime temperature went up hugely. And this was because asphalt and concrete absorbed solar radiation during the day and re-emitted at night, keeping the nighttime temperatures warmer. And anyone who's ever stood up against a brick building in the early evening and feels the heat radiating off of it knows this. And so, yes, there's been warming. If they simply started using the best data throughout the other data, yes, we would still see warming in the United States and in the world. But it wouldn't be as alarming, so to speak. And, but they won't do that. And, and they won't do that because, like I said, it's become a big business and they would have to backtrack. And backtracking is really hard for these folks. A lot of them believe they're really doing honest, decent work here. They believe that when they get something in a peer-reviewed journal that it's accurate. But as Ross McKittrick just demonstrated with 1899, the peer review process didn't work. It failed. It allowed junk science to be published. And now he's having to work very, very hard to try to retract that, and they're resistant to it because their reputation and their funding is at stake. And as far as backtracking goes, no, no one seems to have tried that. Okay, uh, we've got time, I think, for two more questions if the answers are brief and the questions are brief. Uh, this just young lady back here first. Okay, um, so my name is Margo. I'm from Massachusetts. I wrote my question down so I don't stumble. So I'm currently in graduate school to become a clinical social worker as well as work in research in the field. And social work employs a person in environment framework, meaning issues such as climate change, housing insecurity, and healthcare disparities are integral in working with clients. So I'm always looking to increase my knowledge um, and like anything that can inform my practice. And I'm wondering if you're aware of any research uh, related to the psychological impact of climate alarmism. Um, Cause I think, you know, I'm hearing a lot about the environmental impact and just where I'm coming from in my field, I would be interested in learning more how climate change impacts uh, individuals on a psychological level. Um, if, if you'll let me, I'm gonna take this one, Anthony. Say again, into the mic. I, I'm gonna take this one because it's about climate psychology, it's about psychology and whether psychology has anything to say about it. How many stations? No. no. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll take this one. 
I'll take this one. Okay. I, I um, apologize, folks. The reverberation here is just really messing with my hearing. And I have a, I have a transcription device on my phone, and it, the reverberations are so bad up here, it's not even getting it. So I apologize. Well, the, the, this is not a question about, science, uh, about um, temperature data. It's a question about whether uh, there has been any research done on the impact, the psychological impact of climate uh, change, climate alarmism, I would say, on uh, people. I don't know if there's been peer-reviewed. Well, I think there has been. I've actually written about some of this in the past. If you look up some of my climate uh, change weekly lead essays a couple of times, I have written about a sp specifically the impact on children because there have been numerous news stories talking about how children are being psychologically scarred, how they're being damaged, how they have depression. They, they come up a whole, with a whole new term, climate depression. Uh, and it's not the temperature or the weather itself that's causing this harm. It's all the hype surrounding it. The world is going to end. Why should I have children if the world is going to end? And, uh, and we're doing real harm to these kids. We're not doing people a, dis a, a, we're doing them a disservice by constantly hyping the disaster and the scare stories. And there is research out there. Uh, if, you, if you contact me after this, uh, I'll give you my, my card and we can uh, discuss that. This gentleman right here will have the last question. Well, we'll, we'll take you, we'll take you. Thanks. Hello, my name is Javier Martinez from the Nassau Free State of Colorado, but it's still beautiful. Um, my question is, can you comment on the difference between the land-based temperature readings and the newer ones on um, weather balloons and satellite data? And second question would be is, why does the IPCC does not use all three? Okay, uh, he's asking about the difference between uh, the land-based temperature measurements and what's measured by weather balloons and satellites, and why doesn't the IPCC use the weather balloons and satellites as opposed to the ground-based data? Well, the weather balloon satellites are designed for a different purpose. Um, they're not they're not as accurate. Uh, in some ways, and they're prone to all kinds of different vagaries of the weather. And so there is some validity to weather balloon data, although I don't think it's usable for tracing climate. You can point out some differences in the radio son stuff. Uh, they've gone through several different types of radio sons in the past 50 years or so, um, and some of them use some very crude temperature sensors. Um, and so I don't think they're particularly accurate. What they're trying to get is a vertical profile of the atmosphere. And it, it, it has to be reasonably close, but it doesn't have to be precisely accurate to get that vertical temperature profile. So from my perspective, radio sons, while they can provide some useful information, uh, certainly for forecasting weather and getting the vertical atmosphere component figured out, they're not really good for climate, and so that's why they're generally not used. Uh, they also have uh, issues associated with, um, like I say, changing different manufacturers, uh, changing sensors. Some of the sensors I've seen on these things are just nothing more than a a stick coated with carbon, kind of like the old telef uh, telephone receivers. You used to have to bang on the surface in order to get them to work right. Uh, so I'm not too confident in their data. Last question. Hi, um, I'm, a, I'm a journalist, just as a disclaimer. Uh, just to play devil's advocate here. You're, well, you're a journalist with who? I'm a journalist with Channel 4 News in the UK. We're a nightly national uh, news program with ITN. Uh, just to play devil's advocate for all of you, really, and for Dr. McKittrick, if he's on the um, uh, Zoom still, something, whatever, whatever scientific paper you look at would tell you that something like upwards of 97% of scientists currently in the world agree that humans contribute um, to uh, global warming. And when you're talking about IPCC reports, you know, they're not signed off by a couple of people, it's hundreds of scientists in the world, and the wording for those reports is agreed by almost every country in the world. Granted, you don't all agree with that, but if you don't, how do you uh, account for the increasing severity of forest fires, of droughts, of floods that we're seeing in the world. Hold it. 
You're all having a good laugh, but how do you account well, for these things? Uh, I, if if like Dr. Ma if Dr. McKittrick wants here, to take it, 150 foot lower than it was in 2000. Yeah, if Dr. McKittrick wants to take it, that's fine. If not, I'll respond. Um, well, it's kind of a big question to raise in the last 30 seconds of a session. <laughs> um, there are surveys that show 97 percent of, uh, assuming that the survey is, is done right, 97 percent agreement, but. 97% agreement on some very basic, basic issues. You heard Anthony say he's totally on board with the observation of warming since uh, the previous century and that human activities contribute to that. That's the, those are the kinds of statements you get a high level of agreement. You can't then say, and there's 97% agreement on everything else that you added in, including attribution to extreme weather, forest fires and things like that. And if you look at the IPCC reports, they don't draw those strong connections, especially to things like hurricanes and tornadoes and forest fires. So you need to be very precise in what you are alleging a high level of agreement in, and also recognizing that within the mainstream of the climate literature and within the IPCC reports themselves, there are a lot of important active debates, especially around issues concerning extreme weather. Okay, I think that will have to be the close. Thank you uh, all for being here. Give us one last, last thank you to the speakers. Thank you, Sterling. Sorry about the trouble. I just couldn't.